Hello and welcome to Pods Like Us. I'm Martin Quibble, known to my friends as Marv, and this time I'm speaking with George Brooks, who is the CEO of Meta Association. Hey, George, thanks for speaking with me today. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone is well today. Yes. Yes, so do I. What is what is Meta, in case anybody wants to know that's M-E-T-T-A, what is Meta right. Association? Member Association is a nonprofit I started up about five years ago. Uh, I have been going through several things in life. It's a nonprofit that focuses on mental health, black mental health, fighting recidivism, and fatherhood. And I've been able to keep the nonprofit going for over the past five years through the pandemic. The word meta means is a Buddhist word meaning to be inclusive of all. And I want to help as many people as possible. I'm gearing up for 2024 to be our biggest year yet. So your support and donations are definitely needed and appreciated. So Med Association is really out there to try to help people, to try to spread the message about mental health, to try to spread awareness, to try to spread resources and things that people can use to help themselves to deal with their mental illness and emotional wellness. Going into my own experience, I think that the when we had all the lightly, I think my own mother's uh, Alzheimer's, for instance, got worse through the through not being able to be with people and having that being on her own all the time i don't think that helped her and i think that made her alzheimer's get worse really quickly and i think that's a problem with a lot of mental health issues probably is people being or keeping a distance in a, in essence because i think you need that connection to help people be able to hold on to that semblance of sanity that they've got and th that's the thing the real thing with mental illness is first to destigmatize it, is to get people to try to understand that uh, you don't have to be standoffish, that in fact, they can be detrimental to the person dealing with a mental illness, to understand what it is and to really accept the fact that we are all, regardless of race, income, social status, we are all affected by mental illness. And we have to get to where we're comfortable in ourselves and our own mental stability to help those that are dealing with mental illness and to not be an, an entity that makes them feel shame or ridiculed. So it's about the stigmatization, the stigma, the stigmatizing mental illness and educating people about it and exactly what it is. So what actual work do you, what does Meta do for, do then? Do you, the, the, you, I'm guessing that you, I do know that you actually set up what I'm thinking of. You set up events for people to go to, to be able to do speak, to be able to listen to people and get advice from people. And you do one-to-one -one as well for people at the same time. So what is it that you do all these different things that you do? And how do you do these things? Okay. In the past, we've held events. I held an event in my hometown of Memphis that was a speaker's event. We've done food drives in the past. We do, I do a lot of personal advocacy. I have people that call me one-on-one -on -one needing help with issues, and I try to assist them in the best way I can. We also do a lot of public speaking. That's really the main forefront of what I'm focusing on right now because that's what's really going to reach people. And I use my testimony and my story of things I've been through to try to help with, with that. I try to serve maybe too many masters sometimes with a nonprofit. But I'm just trying to help in any area that I can. Any area that finds people being of need that I can bleed into and work my, work my resources to try to help people on any level even if it falls out of the auspices of what I have dictated for Meta Association to be, is what I will endeavor to do. Because yeah, I've noticed that through the, the work that you're doing, it's very, it's a wide scope that you're looking at because you, you look at the mental health and then you look at equality as well and people being treated equally and looking at people's rights and trying to help people with these things. And it's as much as people might just think, oh, it's, these are just these little things, they're not inside these individual things, such as mm. the mental health and the social rights and all these things, inside those, you've got a huge scope inside these individual things as well. Because the, the uh, area of mental health is so wide ranging in terms of its, what it affects. 
in that regard, we do have to broaden our scope because it's not just a matter of this, the advocacy or the dealing with the medication or dealing with that. There are social implications and, and societal implications that come with dealing with and living with a mental illness that we have never addressed. And we, we're, we're at a point by our own neglect, by not dealing with it, by hiding it, by ostracizing people dealing with it. We've put ourselves behind the eight ball is that, that we have a lot more work to do to get to a point where there is some parity, where there is a sense of where even those living with severe mental illnesses can have an equal point to where they can start off and excel and, and live a full life. We're playing a lot of catch up right now, but we have people in place that are doing that. I'm blessed to, to have a wonderful cabal of associates that I deal with, and we're all out here doing the work. Yeah, mental health, one of the things that, that jumps out at me would be the some people will look at mental health and look at crime at the same time, and that's an issue that is almost missed in a way. I think in a lot of cases, some mental health issues are not spotted because people aren't there looking for these things and trying to help these things. And it happens a lot with crime where you'll find that a lot of criminals have got mental health issues and it's a, it's a bad thing. I, I remember when I was younger, it wasn't crime based, but I remember that because I was abused as a child and then into our adulthood, that still affected me in a mental way. Some people would use drugs and alcohol and substances, and I, I did the same in essence, to try and combat those issues. And I think a lot of people do that where they'll almost self-medicate on substances that they shouldn't be doing to try and negate those things that cause them these problems. Right. In terms of crime in the U.S., the number one provider of mental health care in this country is the American penal system. Because oftentimes those, those living with mental illness are misdiagnosed. They're oftentimes in, in, in situations and sometimes they just make bad decisions that, that, that facilitate their involvement with the criminal justice system. So part of why we fight recidivism is that we can't necessarily always stop people from going to jail. But what we can do on the back end is make sure they have what they need in terms of resources, in terms of, of social programs and serves of of understanding of what they've been through to deal with their mental illness, because many of those uh, in this country that are incarcerated are dealing with mental and emotional I issues. And as someone who, who dealt with a 10 year addiction myself, you are spot on when you say that a lot of it is self-medication. It's to quiet the noise in your head. It's to deal with the trauma that you didn't even deal with from your childhood or from your life. It's to help stop the pain. But the thing is, it ends up making everything a lot worse. I think that's really the key to stopping addiction is to deal with the unresolved trauma that caused the addiction and not just focus on the addiction itself. We want to focus on the cure and not just the symptoms. Yes, we need to treat the symptoms of the, of, of the uh, disorder, of the disease, of the choice. But yet at the same time, we have to deal with the, with the cause of it and, and the core root of what causes people to fall into addiction in the first place. Yeah, going into that with, with the incarceration, that was something that really jumped out at me from when you were speaking about it on one, one of the shows that you were a guest on. And I thought, you, you're right, because mm -hmm. in this country and in some other countries, we have some systems in place where there are, for mental health with crime, there are places where they can go to that aren't a prison, they're specifically set for that sort of thing. But even then, even over here, even though I say that in the UK, it's still few and far between. And we still, there's right. still some that fall through the cracks. Nobody's perfect with these things, but it needs to be looked at. And in essence, they, even in this country and in all countries with these things, there needs to be a system in place where they're keeping things in check and making sure that these systems that are wrong they're always trying to better so that they, they might not reach the 100% perfection, but they're aiming towards that. There needs to be a more concerted effort to treat those with mental illness and, and not just those with mental illness, but those with any disability. I, I found that in my work in my hometown of Memphis and in, in, in adopted home of Dallas, that oftentimes those with any disability fall through the cracks. And it's more so with mental illness because a mental illness is not apparent. You can't see it. It's not something that's obvious or like that. So people have a harder time grasping it because it's more abstract to them. That's just something that you can see. You can see signs of it 
And the thing is, a lot of times with mental illness in this society, we don't know what mental illness actually looks like. We, we may have this preconceived notion that it may be somebody rambling to themselves on the street corner, but we don't know it's that guy that's working nine to five with five kids that's dealing with something. They may be drinking a little bit too much. They may be going through something. And, and we don't want those situations to get where they become a powder keg in terms of not dealing with one's mental and emotional health, where they become dangerous to society and to people as individuals also. These issues have been going on for years. For instance, I mean, I was listening to a show the other day. Shout out to the wonderful show, Womanic, where they talk about strong women in the past and things and what they did to change things. And they were on about an actress. And I, I just noticed this in passing, and they, just because it, it's a nerve in a sense. And they were talking about the actress Vivian Lee, apparently... She, right. because they didn't know about it at the time, she actually suffered from bipolar. And obviously, bipolar, nobody knew about bipolar until the 1980s. And there's right. various people in, in, in celebrities now and from the past that have, have suffered from it. It jumped out at me because they, that's the sort of thing where you, you look into the history of it and these things back in the day, they used to be, they would just throw them into an institution and essentially forget about them back in the day. And we've only come a step away from that situation now where, like you said, people aren't noticing these things. And it's things like bipolar where people have things to keep themselves in check. So you don't see these things in people because they're hiding them essentially and those around them are hiding them. But it's there and that's one of the big problems. Right, because in my, in my own personal journey with mental illness, I, I, I began to realize I had mental health issues about age seven. And one thing I've learned how to do is how, how to mask my emotions, how to mask what I'm feeling. I could be perfectly calm and smiling, but have a storm going on inside my head and inside my heart. Because that's a survival mechanism for those of us dealing with mental illness is that we can't always articulate what, what's going on with us. So we learn to hide, we learn to mask, we learn to lie about how we feel or what's going on, and we learn to manipulate. That's just a survival mechanism. It doesn't make us bad people because that's usually not the case. Usually those of us with mental illness are the ones getting victimized. So it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with. And in terms of bipolar disorder, I've heard of it being called manic depression. That's what it used to be known as. And that goes yep. far back into the 60s as far as my knowledge goes. So it's not new, but it's, it's something that we're starting to understand. We're starting to understand mental illness, especially bipolar, because that's my diagnosis. One. But that's something we're starting to understand from a social, as a social construct, something we're starting to understand as a biological phenomenon. And through that, I think the care is getting much better, but it has a long way to go. But until we continue to chip away at, at the boulder of the, of the stigma of mental illness, nothing's really going to advance much further than where it has. And while I'm happy that things have advanced this far in this short amount of time, we still have a very long way to go. We do. And in, in the, in, in when people are incarcerated, one thing that they could have is possibly better medical staff where they have people there to be able to diagnose these things and have one-to-ones, maybe with, a, with somebody in the background, just in case, with them, a member of staff, one of the, one of the people that work there. But then you'd have these medical people working there who are professionals and who can diagnose these things and look into these things with these essentially people that are put into jail. And the thing is, staffing and, and having uh, quality clinicians and those that are administrators and, and workers with those with mental health has to be something that needs to be raised in terms of the bar. We have to have people that are dedicated. We have to have people that are well-trained and that are able to uh, deal with those situations that often come up when you're dealing with someone with mental So there has to be a tremendous amount of compassion. There has to be a tremendous amount of understanding from those working with those with mental illness. Now, if you don't, then you have a system that's going to be rife with abuse and neglect. And we definitely need more resources. We need more beds for those with mental illness. We need more facilities. We need better facilities. We need places and transition and aftercare plans and all these things that through my nonprofit mental association, I'm working to try to put in place. And that's my duty. That's my purpose that God has for me is just to try to do what I can. But I'm able to help people by pointing out, we need to do this. We need to do that. So I'm looking to collaborate with people. I'm looking to do public speaking. I'm looking to travel. I'm looking to do whatever I got to do. 
every day to make sure that those that went through what I went through and are going through what I'm going through don't have to feel the way I feel, if that makes sense. Yeah, if, if they approach these things in, in that sort of way, you, you're going to, with, with those people who have mental health issues that are in, this, in these places, you then cut down the possibility of recidivism then, because for anybody wanting to know, recidivism is basically repeated habitual relapse into specific things. You we're talking crime at the moment right. where people will relapse into crime based on their own mental health, which is what's causing them to li- to do this repeated exercise. If you but, hit these things head on and you see these things and do something about them, you cut down the chance of them actually relapsing and doing this repeated almost thing that they repeat because it's like they're within them to keep doing these things. If you have somebody there that's actually working towards helping these people, you cut down the chance of them doing that. And the thing you have to keep in mind, I, I'm not sure where it is in other parts of the world, but I know in the U.S. there is a prison industrial complex. There is an entire industry built on incarceration. But the powers that be and those that profit aren't necessarily interested in healing those that are dealing with incarceration, especially from a mental health standpoint, because that's basically them cutting off their in- inventory. They, those systems survive and thrive off reoffenders. They basically, and, and it, the thing is that prison is, is punitive, but it should be some point rehabilitative because the thing is, most of those people in jail are going to come back out into society. If you relegate it to something that's just punitive, where is the healing? Where is the part that's going to make them viable members of society once they are released? What's going to make them contributors to the society instead of detracting from society? But there, there's a prison system. There are private prisons here. There, there are whole industries predicated on their being uh, inmates. So that's one thing we have to combat. We have to find a way to needle our way through that and navigate that to make sure that people get help in the best way that we can see fit. And something else that jumped out at me was, did you take part in the, is it the mission trip to, to Jamaica with the Terry Foundation, or was that something that you were just promoting? Give me the last part of your question. Yep. I read on your Instagram uh, page something about a, a trip to Jamaica with Terry Foundation, and I wondered if you were part of that or if it was just something that I noticed you were promoting. There's something that you just noticed I'm promoting. As far as this year, I'll be looking to collaborate with more nonprofits. And if you follow me on social media, which is George P. Brooks on Facebook, and I, we have a new site coming up, metaassociation.org. That should be up in the next couple of weeks. You'll be able to follow our collaborators. You'll be able to support them as well because they support us. And I believe in symbiotic relationships, in reciprocal relationships, in life and in terms of business. And the thing about running a nonprofit is that we oftentimes forget it's a business. In order to do the work, we have to have, we have to be fiduciarily sound. We have to have things in place. We have to have profit and loss. We have to have marketing. And that's really what drives doing the work. So uh, I do promote like-minded organizations. I do promote uh, people that are doing the work as well. So if you follow my social media, you'll see who, who, who I'm supporting and you'll see who I stand behind and you see who I believe in as far as doing the work to help improve mental illness for all people. It's all good work that you are promoting, whether it's the work that you're doing or the work that you're promoting for other people as well. So I've got here, what is it? Finding direction in life. Yep. I, I enjoyed your discussion as well with on conversations with Kings as well, when you were speaking about living and p- people basically being parents, but with a mel- mental illness as well. I'm a parent with a mental illness and I'm ra- I raised a son with a mental illness and it's just more challenging. You have to really try to balance so much more because not only do you have the responsibility of taking care of your child with a mental illness, you have the responsibility of making sure that you're okay because you don't ever want a parent in a position where you're compromised. So sometimes that means being, being relying more on your therapy, on your medication to make sure that you're okay so that you can be the best parent that you possibly can be. Especially dealing with a child with a mental illness who in the today's day and time has its own unique challenges. So parenting, parenting while mentally ill is doable, but it's difficult and it can be just as rewarding as someone who does not have that to deal with. Absolutely. Definitely. So we've got your professional history. We've talked about meta association and how you are how to approach mental health and wellness. We've only touched the surface. It's a huge right. subject. In in, in essence. Really, I could go to this now in a sense, 
in essence, you need a podcast about these subjects to be able to look at them in their individual different subjects. Because it's one big, it's not one big subject. It's lots of little different subjects that's under one umbrella, essentially. And I believe well, I you're looking yeah, towards yeah. doing a podcast yourself at some point. Called the Meta Mindset. We're going to launch later this year. Uh, I'm working on another podcast with my dear friend, a wonderful therapist, Anil Batiste, out of Austin, Texas. So I'm looking to, to get out there and promote myself and promote my cause. I feel that by me doing these, these appearances, and thank you for having me on, that okay. we're spreading the word one by one in terms of mental health. We're doing what we need to do to make sure that we can facilitate healing, progress, things like that. that that's really what we're working on and what we're endeavoring to do. So what was your initial introduction to podcasts then? When did you start listening to them? And, and was it based on your own uh, history with mental health? Is that how you, what the sort of shows that you started listening to, or you're a wide, do you listen to a wide variety? I'm an audiophile. I like listening to different kinds of music and podcasts and different shows. And I started back in the nineties when I got on the internet back in 1994 and listened to different broadcasts and things like that. So it's something I've always had so much energy for. Yeah. And I started, really started doing appearances like maybe two years ago. And it's been great fun. It's been a great run. I've learned a lot, but I, I feel like. Now that podcasting is so accessible to many people that you're going to really see a, a wide range of topics covered. And it's just my hope that those topics that are covered really, really help people because we have venues now, we have opportunities, but they have been in social media. Everyone has a voice, good or bad. Not everybody deserves a voice, but everybody has a voice. It's just been a matter of spreading awareness and doing those things that are going to try to make, hopefully make the world a better place. Let's just say the good thing about podcasting is that you will get, for the most part, people, you'll get real people speaking really about subjects. Right. But at the, the other side of the coin is a bad part of podcasting is that you've got real people talking about real subjects because <laughs> some people, you know, it's life essentially. It's not sugar-coated like a television show or like a professional big corporation. A lot of them now are just people in their own room like we are now, just speaking as they are with no nothing they're hiding who they are. Well, don't forget, yeah, basically with no filter. And that can be a, uh, that can be a blessing and a curse. Yeah. Uh, it, really, it really can be. So it really just depends on the facilitator of, of the person hosting the podcast and what their vision for their show is. It's the new Wild West. Everyone, all you need is a laptop or a phone and you can do a podcast. But the thing is to make sure that the guests we have are measured, to make sure that they're not just ranting, that they bring something substantive to the conversation. And by doing that, we can gain from the insight and progress further. During your listening to shows over all this time, what lessons would you say that you've learned from those shows that you are going to use in the future when you do start your own podcast? A lot of it is more technical in terms of the public speaking. It's things like having an outline, having bullet points, getting your story, getting your verbiage across the right way. So technically, it's been very rewarding. But also, just the great exposure from hearing different voices, from hearing different people, from hearing different perspectives. That's what's been helpful because there have been some things that I was stalwart on that I, I was not willing to relent on as far as different mindsets or, or thinking. But I've had some people help me look at things from a different perspective. And if you go into it with an open mind, it can be a wonderful place and a wonderful activity for you to partake in because we are not always the same person. I'm not yeah. the same person I was a month ago. And with that, through interacting with other people and hearing divergent opinions and different stories, we can craft our narrative and how we feel about things in a way that's more unique to who we are. I completely agree with that. I'm through this show, I think I'm a completely different person to the person I was more than three years ago when I first started, I think the constant right. chatting to people has opened me up as a person and made it easier for me to speak with people. In essence, the more right. that you, the more that you use a certain part of your self, the, the better that you get at it in some ways and you change constantly through life anyway, or you try to. Very true. What has your listening been like since you first started? Did you start a certain way and then you listened to more things and more subjects and different types of shows since? I, I'm the type, I, I'm an egalitarian, first of all, yeah. but I like to study various subjects. Anything that holds my interest, anybody that knows me knows, I kind of get obsessed about it and study it ad nauseum. So 
I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. I've learned things that from other areas that have, have inspired and motivated me and influenced me in terms of my mental health work. I believe you can take inspiration from anywhere. Even if you're a SpongeBob fan, you can take something from SpongeBob. It just depends on what you take from it. I, I've been fortunate. I've been able to take in a lot of media, take in a lot of different opinions. I do a lot of reading, like the Book of Five Rings by Masashi Miyamoto, The Richest Man in Babylon, things like that. I study a lot of stoicism. So I've been able to incorporate that into who I am as a person and as a mental health advocate. I, I can see where you're coming from. You, you hinted at something just then, and we're go, going into a tangent now, and we haven't yet. And I'm going to say that media and entertainment, in essence, like you said, with the SpongeBob thing, it, it's strange because these things, as much as people who are creatives say these things are just things that they've created and there's nothing about them in it. I'm not 100% sure that I really believe that. As somebody who writes music, I've got my guitars and my keyboard over here and other instruments at the back of me. As much as I might say, oh, that song doesn't say anything about me, it does. And these things that people create, there's little messages that people get into them. The, the famous one would be in the 60s when all the Star Treks, for instance, they had social conscience messages hidden, not very well hidden, I might add, in the background, trying to tell people things about race, about sexuality and how things should be better and this, that and the other. And so I do think that entertainment is a mirror to the way that things are at that point around them. And that's how people who are creatives get those things out there. Right. Well, being a creative, uh, you really have, it's really a blessing in the sense that you have the ability to always submit your commentary on society through your yep. art. If you're a painter, you can paint what you're feeling, you can paint what in society and how it makes you feel. Being a guitarist, you can write a song that articulates that. I'm somewhat of a creative myself. Uh, I write, I draw, I'm looking to get into music, I'm trying to do some acting. That's another thing that's a, that, that's really unfortunate in that I can articulate my feelings on society and my feelings in general through those mediums. The one thing that I espouse as a treatment, as a as an adjunct to dealing with your mental health, is try to get into something creative. Even if you can't draw a line, Try to draw something, try to get something to externalize those feelings and to express that in a way that not only relieves you and absolves you of a lot of pain and discomfort, but it gives the world a chance to see what's going on, to see what it's like, to see what you're feeling and to see who you are. I'm a huge advocate for these things such as I've spoken with people who teach music in, in certain places for people who have mental is health issues. Music right. is a big thing that people will do and i believe the same for acting and for, for like you said art as in painting anything really that that helps them that it's in in a sense you're just centering them and it helps them right. to calm and gives them something to put the mind to 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 keep the the semblance of who they are in essence and it also gives them something where they have a sort of pride where or oh, I, I i i couldn't play this instrument this time but four weeks later i know these three chords on a guitar and i can do this chord pattern and play and do this song with this and this sort of those mm. things that give them that positivity because a lot of it is negativity that makes their mental health worse where if you right. give them something to make them feel more positive that helps them and boosts them up exactly exactly and that, and that's definitely true because we have to have outlets for it goes on with us, especially mentally and emotionally, you have to, that internalization of things, especially in terms of black meat has really damaged us. Uh, but we can no longer just internalize those things and sit on those feelings and not find a way to deal with them or address them or to allow them to manifest themselves in a healthy way that's going to be conducive toward healing. So that's something that we really need to work on. And I, I think we've made a lot of progress, but you have to find what works for you. And you have to be open toward healing with therapy, with talking, with your, even your spirituality is an important part. Even what you eat is important because the majority of serotonin is generated from the gut. So what you eat is important. I've noticed this personally. So there are so many things that, that tie into mental health, but really mental health is integral because along with our physical health, without it, we cannot function. We cannot do anything. So just like people endeavor to go to the doctor to, to get their physicals done. Yeah. They have to endeavor to, to deal with uh, their mental and emotional health as well. Absolutely. 
So we've done that. So when you're listening to podcast, I'm getting, I'm trying to get into the weeds here in, in essence, right. as somebody who makes podcast and in essence, I'm being asked by other podcasters. When I speak to people who listen to podcast and haven't started their own at the moment, that they will keep asking me these questions, podcasters will. So when you're looking at a podcast show, what are you looking for in, not just in subject, but is there a certain style of production or a certain style of structure that these shows have that you look for, or are you more bothered about the subject in hand and what they're talking about than the actual production and the way that they're approaching? To me, what's more important than production or the subject matter, because I can talk about anything. Yeah. Sorry, I just can't. But it's the, the tone of the interviewer. Uh, I like more conversational podcast periods. I think those are the ones where I'm able to really articulate and I think to articulate what's going on and we really get to some good stuff once it's more conversational. So one thing I look for uh, is someone that can be rigid. Yeah, you can have your outline for me as a guest or questions, but should we feel free to delve off the beaten path and then get into some things that are maybe real issues or things that I'm dealing with at the time or things that the host is dealing with at the time or things in society. We need to have latitude and room to do that. And that's really what I look for. That's great. That's fantastic. Okay. So what I've, I've got here, three life tips. What are three tips that you would suggest to people that would be helpful to them? Be patient with yourself. That's one thing that I had to learn and I'm still learning. Be patient with yourself. Understand that you cannot judge yourself according to what someone else has done. You have your, you are your only competitor. Compare yourself to where you were a month ago, a year ago five years ago, 10 years ago, that should be your only barometer for where you are and the progress that you're making. If you look in the, if you're driving and you're steadily looking in the car next to you, you're going to have an accident. Stay in your lane, focus on yourself, be patient, work on yourself. Number two is take care of your physical health. Try not to consume, try to, and I'm somewhat of a hypocrite on this, but try not to consume things that, that are not going to be beneficial to your physical health. Try to make sure you get some exercise. Try to make sure you stay active. Even when you're going through a depression or you're going through something mentally. Um, my friend Shannon Albert, she, she always advocates for getting sun, walking in the grass barefoot, things like that. Do things like that to take care of yourself physically. And third, and really in a way, most importantly, is to try to treat other people. I believe, I'm a believer in karma. When we go through something, it's usually as a result of something that, that we've done or good or bad. So try to treat people. Try to be compassionate. Try to, when you ask someone how their day is going, actually mean it sometimes. And those are my three tips. I'm going to say this one again. I'm, I can't believe that I'm, I'm saying this again, but before Christmas, you, you said that about compassion for people. And so before Christmas, I was in town with my other half and we're going for some, we're going for some jabs for something. Mm -hmm. for, for, we get the flu jab every year, cut down on possibility of getting influenza. So we went right into town to get those. And while I was in town, I saw, cause we have a, we have a magazine in the UK called the, called Big Issue which right. that, that magazine is sold by the homeless and the money that, that they make from that, they get a percentage of, and the rest of it goes into what's called shelter, which is an organization that looks after the homeless. So I was in town and saw this obvious homeless lady selling, selling this magazine. And I'll preface this by saying that I have a donation that comes from my account to shelter every month anyway. So I'm always given to shelter and right. organizations. So I'll preface it with this. So I saw this lady there in town and I just saw that she, she seemed to be cold because she had a scarf around her face and she was had a woolly hat on and was basically trying to stay warm. So as opposed to buying this really thick magazine that essentially I wasn't probably going to read anyway, but I also give to that organization that makes the magazine anyhow. I thought another option to do was, and which I took was I walked up to her and asked her what hot drink would she want, how she takes the hot drink. And then I went to a place that sells coffee or, and tea and she wanted tea. So I got a tea to exact him, you know, what she wanted, the milk and the sugar that she takes. And I bought her a couple of chocolate cookies as well because, mm -hmm. and then handed them to her because my thought was there. The, I was handing over to her something that was more important than her taking 50 pence or a pound of right. that money 
from the sale of the for the sale of the magazine. I thought it was more important in that moment. She needed that cup of tea and that for sustenance because she'd been out there for about eight hours solid trying to sell this magazine. And afterwards, I was saying to my other half that even though money is sometimes tight and think situations aren't good, I said that in essence, the thing that you've got to remember and you really have to do this is you don't lose who you are and the humanity of life. You don't lose that humanity. You always make sure that you're looking at what other people are going through, even if you're going through bad times at the same time. If you can see this and do something about that, that in essence is one of the greatest things in life is noticing that and helping those people out. And it's definitely true. And it's definitely true. And I'm glad you brought up losing our humanity. I think there's something in our society that we're starting to lose because everything is so antiseptic and we see wars on TV and it's not real. It's like we're almost living in a video game sometimes when we look at our fellow man. Yeah. Because the way we, the lens that we look at it through in terms of social media and TV and we are losing our humanity. And that's why I encourage people to get out and, and, and put the phones down and try to get out and meet people and be around people and try to volunteer in events. If you want to understand about mental illness, go volunteer at the mental health organization. If you like animals, volunteer there because those nonprofits and organizations are reliant on that, that volunteer work, on those donations, on those gestures, on that $5 or five pounds that you extend to them because it goes toward helping toward them uh, addressing the cause that they chosen to endeavor upon. So, but we have lost our humanity. And I was glad to hear that what you just said, because you didn't think of, you thought about the person, yep. not just the gesture. Otherwise you could have just bought the magazine and said, well, she'll get us eventually, but you saw a need there immediately and you addressed it. And I commend you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. So what advice would you give to podcasters or people potentially becoming podcasters? Half fun. Have fun because you're going to stumble. You're going to make mistakes. But the minute things stop to be, stop being fun, then you're probably not going to do it. Try to have fun, be unique, be who you are. Don't try to ascribe to, to, to what someone else has done. Yeah. You can be derivative, but not verbose. And what I mean by that is you take elders from a podcast that you're a fan of, but try to make it your own, try to make it your own and just have fun with it and see what comes of it and try to monetize it and try to maximize it and really commit to it and really do it as though it's something that's important to you. If it's not, then you won't last anyway. But for those that really want to do something, put your all into it, put your effort into it, and you'll see, you'll get out what it is that you put in. I like the thing that you said about derivative, essentially inspire, be inspired by these other podcasts. It's like music, you be inspired by these people and then take those different inspirations and add yourself to it to make something that is 100% you based on the inspiration. It's, it's like the rock band Queen, they, they're influenced by this sort of music, that sort of music, that sort of music. Another one by the Dust is based on soul and disco and music like that. Wow. And this is based on that type of music. But when they do it, it's essentially Queen. It's not them being a carbon copy of this person. You know, Kendrick Lamar is not basically a rehash of Stevie Wonder, although he is a part of the inspiration that inspires him. And, and, and that's exactly the thing, because there are a few things in the world now that are most, that are really original. Don't worry about necessarily being original. Just be who you are. Just be who you are. Feel confident in your voice and just do the best you can as far as do, doing the podcast. Try to get to where you, you know who you want to have on guest wise. Try to get to where you have more of a conversation than an interview. Yep. So to me, those are really the good ones, the ones that are most conversation, more conversation. So that's the advice that I would give you. Be conversational and try to have fun doing it. If you need something like I have with this list of notes to follow, if you need that to be able to make the show work, and I, I think it helps a lot, remember essentially what you're saying is you could have that, but you've got to be open to catch those little bits and let the conversation flow as opposed to it just being ask the question, get the answer, ask the question, get the answer. Let the, yeah. con let the conversation come into it. So if things come up, you've got to be able to pick up on these things and be like, oh, where will that road take me if I go down there? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you should, you, it should be an adventure. Every podcast that you have a guest on should be an adventure to find out about them and find out maybe more about yourself. Yeah.
That's absolutely true. <laughs> yeah. I, tr I tried to hide that it's about me as well, but there you go. It is true. So what podcast shows would you suggest to people that you like that people should probably try and listen to or check out? I listen to podcasts that are aligned with my personal interests. Like I, I'm a huge pro wrestling fan. So I listen to a lot of pro wrestling podcasts, retro video game podcasts, comic book podcasts. I really don't necessarily listen for work unless I'm going to be on the show. But I, I, I listen to things that are in line with my hobbies, that are aligned with my interests. So I spend a lot of time on YouTube watching different shows and content. I probably watch more YouTube than I do TV. Yeah. Really hadn't watched TV in about five years, seriously. But I, I listen to things that, that, that make me happy, that help me relax. Like I'm probably going to do some video games today if I can't, if I have time. So I'm probably going to watch a podcast like that. Just something just to be fun and be light. And, and that way, when I have to go into the heavier areas, it's not as burdensome. So, yeah, you just try to watch what you enjoy. Watch what you enjoy. Watch new things. Watch different things. Watch, I watch things about subjects that I'm interested in, like Greek mythology, Norse mythology, Stoicism, those kind of things. So that's what, really what I enjoy watching. That's great. Where can people find you and get hold of you then, George? All right. You can reach me on Facebook under George P. Brooks. We will have our site up in a couple of weeks, meta, M-E-T-A, association.org. You can also call me in the U.S. My number is 901-631-4300. I'm available for public speaking, collaborations, willing to travel, just anything that's going to help in terms of helping those with mental health and helping those in other issues too. I also speak on fatherhood, addiction, relationships, community efforts, all those sort of things. And you can, and the best way to get in touch with me is to email me at gbrooks, G-B-R-O-O-K-S, at metaassociation.org. Thank you very much. Anyway, you, you can find... Thank you. You can find Pods Like Us on any streaming platform, on Apple, on... I'm, I'm losing it now. Spotify, Amazon, Google. I don't think Google's doing podcasts anymore, actually. I think they finished and Deezer's finished as well. And we're also on uh, Roku as well. If you go to Pod Nation, you can watch a video version of the show. And we have a YouTube page. Just look for Pods Like Us on any of these places, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Tuck and Threads as well. And contact us through podslikeus at gmail.com. We do have a Patreon, which is just look for Pods Like Us. And for, because I'm English, it's one pound per month. You get extra little shows where I do reviews of podcasts or I do a podcasting diary as well. And anyway, thank you everyone for listening and hope you listen again to another episode of Pods Like Us. There you go, George. Thank you. That's fine. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Thank you, George. You take care. Thank you. All right. Everyone stay blessed. Bye-bye. Thank you.